Uh, welcome back. Uh, now, the attack on author Sir Salman Rushdie at an event in New York has again raised questions of freedom of speech and the right to protect it. Well, over the weekend, the controversial comedian Jerry Sadowitz had his Edinburgh Festival show cancelled following complaints. So, should we be allowed to cause offence or should there be limits? Here's Liz Summers. Joining us now is Tom Slater, editor of political magazine Spiked Online, who says... You have to be able to offend people, otherwise we don't have free speech. And journalist Martha Gill, who believes people hide behind the phrase free speech as a way of justifying the offence. Uh, it's difficult to know where to begin. I, I hope you don't mind. I'll start with uh, you, Martha, because it seems to me the burden's on you when it comes to uh, <laughs> making a case for limiting free speech. I, it's a quick story. I haven't had enough time. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. He used to take my brother and I to Speaker's Corner where you could listen to what people say. It wasn't keyboard warrioring. And sometimes it was anti-Semitic bile, and he'd say, you see, in this country, this man can say anything, because he knew the value of free speech, and that was the price of democracy under the rule of law. It's why uh, people, including our grandparents, sometimes our parents at home, even people alive today, fought and died for that value. But why do you say that's not a value worth defending? Well, as you say, we do have a lot of free speech in this country. You can say almost anything that you want, um, depending on audience, of course. Um, I think that I'm arguing not for all censorship, I think free speech is very important, uh, but that there is a line. Uh, you know, for example, there are topics, there are, there are hate speech laws, I think it's important to have a few of those. You know, you don't want people inciting terrorist action. I those think are already illegal. Yes, and I think that's limits on free speech, isn't it? Right. And I think those are important limits on free speech. Mm -hmm. um, there Who are says certain. Sorry? Who says they're not limits on free speech? I mean, well, the right to, to say whatever you want, no matter who you offend, are, is limited by those laws. And I think, quite rightly, there are other limits on free speech on topics on which there, are, there is large social cons consensus and, in particular, and to particular audiences. For example, a topic on which would alienate all of your audiences, I think you have the right to make the commercial decision not to bring defendants of those views. Take, for example, something completely outrageous. There was a Society for the Protection of Paedophiles back in the 70s. I don't think you'd want to chair a debate on here uh, with somebody defending those views. And I think you'd be quite right to stop a speaker speaking or somebody defending the Holocaust to your audience... Uh, sorry, defending... Um, denying the Holocaust to your audiences. I think there are some limits, and I think that different institutions should have the freedom to express their views as companies and institutions um, by not hosting people with particular views. OK, well, Tom, what do you make of that, then? The fact that, you, you know, yes, we should have free speech, but there should be a line, there should be limits to that. I think there's actually something quite grotesque about talking about limits on free speech in the wake of what we saw on Friday. Um, if you don't have the right to offend, you don't have freedom of speech. No one's ever been attacked or locked up for saying something that upset absolutely no one. And I think what we saw in New York State is the horrendous logical endpoint of this ideology that we now have. If you elevate taking offence as, like, some great moral crime, if you say that speech is violence, the consequence of that is, is violence and unreason and a society which is less harmonious. Um, and if we're talking about hate speech, if we're talking about the most bigoted ideas imaginable, no-one's mind has ever been changed, no idea has ever been defeated by just silencing it. And this is the lesson of history as well. I mean, people always talk about hate speech laws as, you know, you need them because otherwise Nazi Germany will come back, crudely put, that's how the argument is. Weimar Germany had hate speech laws and Nazis were prosecuted under it and they used it as a propaganda exercise and it certainly didn't stop them in their tracks. Hate speech, even extreme speech, the answer to it is more speech. But I think the problem we have today is there's all kinds of views which are not even nearly that extreme which are being silenced either by law or by social custom. So well, that's we're far the beyond point, those But Martha's, Martha's point, I mean, thinly valid, um, is <laughs> the idea that there are certain arguments that are beyond the pale and mm. that uh, private companies and private spaces should be able to, what you might describe as no platform them because they give them legitimacy. If you put them on at university or you put them on here and her paedophile yeah, example, what, 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 what yeah. would you say to that, Tom? Well, I think the bounds for that are shrinking so much, we've got to take it very, very seriously. I mean, we're not here talking about Holocaust denial or about pro-paedophilia propaganda anymore. If you think about some of the big free speech discussions we've had in recent years, a lot of them centre around, say, gender-critical feminists who care about the issue of women's spaces and biological sex. People have been arrested for expressing those views. People have lost their jobs 
for expressing those views. That is not some moral majority asserting itself. Um, that is actually quite a narrow elite position on that particular issue, which is being imposed across the board. You know, we talk about, oh, the satanic verses wouldn't get published today, which is um, almost undoubtedly true. We could be in a position where Harry Potter wouldn't get published <laughs> today, uh, not because of its content, but because of its author's views. And if you don't believe me, there was a... If you look at some of the authors who are much less, much less prominent than J.K. Rowling, the, the flack they got and the work that they lost just for supporting her, well, I think, shows about us time, how bad and I think, uh, Martha, you have a strong view in response to that. Sorry. Well, I think, obviously, um, when debates are still open, when debates, for example, with the comp competition of two oppressed groups fighting for rights, they're still very much open, you need to have complete free speech on those topics. I'm saying there is a line uh, somewhere for particular debates which are flatly over, like, is it OK to black up? No, it's not. We've decided that as a society a long time ago. And that topic is rightly taboo. If we reopen that debate, it's actually sort of um, damaging in a way to free speech or at least public discourse because it suggests that all debates can go round and round and round forever and we can never make any progress uh, with them. Um, you know, also, uh, uh, There's a you know, what, 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 you're, what you're sort of suggesting is that all audiences have to tolerate any views. That's not what I'm suggesting. Well, people don't well yeah. like... he, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to correct you. He, he didn't suggest that. I mean, you have uh, freedom. You have the freedom to switch off. You have mm. the freedom not to attend. You have a comedian uh, who was cancelled. Um, he had... Uh, a you triple... were arguing that he was wrong specific... for that venue yeah, he had to, specific... to were... not host him. He had specific warnings about the offence that might be, be caused. Now, um, I think you're probably right. There are social mores. I wouldn't want to go and listen to homophobia. I wouldn't want to listen uh, to anti-Jewish racism any more than any other form of, of racism. Um, the reality is um, uh, we've, society's already met that response. You can't see it on television. That's not a form of censorship. It's the way we've evolved. I wonder if you can help me with this Orwell quote, you as a journalist, you know, across the board, that uh, for liberty to mean anything, it must mean the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. Um, sometimes people may not want to, to hear things. How do we maintain freedom with your position, Martha? I think there's quite a lot of confusion here, uh, confusion here with, the, with the two topics that we started with. Uh, you can't compare an illiberal regime uh, like the one in Iran that issued the, the, the fatwa to a liberal one. In liberal societies, taboos tend to accumulate to, to, to um, protect oppressed groups, but the same people pushing for that um, reduces the number of taboos about speaking about dominant groups. Like, it's much easier now to criticise the dominant uh, religion in this country, Christianity. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to, 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 to um, talk about the monarchy. It's much easier to criticise politicians over time. Um, and, you know, talk about sex and things like that, even as other taboos are building. In illiberal societies, it's the other way around. Dominant groups crack down, use the full force of the law to crack down on anyone criticising the ruling groups. You can say whatever you like about women and gay people. There's huge amounts of freedom of speech there. You can say all kinds of disgusting things about the people at the very bottom of society. So uh, what we're looking at is not... And also, in this country, the people who tend to resist wokeism are also the people who wouldn't hear anything bad said about the Queen. You often I find... I would happily it... hear many bad things said about the Queen, but I should just right. say, what you're talking here is essentially about punching down, right? And yet what we're talking about in relation to Salman Rushdie or many of the other scandals, Batley Grammar, all these different situations, is, it, is essentially a blasphemy law being erected by the back door. If we're talking about punching up and punching down, I can't think... You, if we're talking about gods and prophets and religions, I can't think that you can punch much higher than that. Yeah. And this is really important. What we're doing with all these issues, and we're tying ourselves in knots, is we're limiting free speech and we're undermining something like the right to offend, something like the right to blaspheme, which freedom of speech in this country and around the world is built on. And we've got to be very careful there. No, no, sorry. And it, this could go on all morning. It, 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 it it's could. fascinating hearing your views, um, but we all mm. have to draw that to a line. But thank you so much for joining us yeah. this uh, evening. That's Tom and Martha.